It's my pleasure to introduce Jacqueline Gehagen, Jackie Gehagen, who is here with us at Dalhousie and who wears many, many hats, uh, both here and elsewhere. She's Professor of Health Promotion and she's Head of the Health Promotion Division in the School of Health and Human Performance. She is also Director of the Gender and Health Promotion Studies Unit which focuses on health research related to the intersectionality of gender and other key determinants of health. Uh, she holds cross appointments in Community Health and Epi, International Development Studies, Gender Studies, Occupational Therapy, Nursing, and she's an affiliate member of our very own Health Law Institute. So she's been involved in the field of HIV AIDS advocacy activism and research for over 20 years now. Um, her current funded program of research focuses primarily on gendered aspects of HIV, Hep C, sexually transmitted infections, and sexual health outcomes. She is a founding member of the Atlantic Interdisciplinary Research Network. She's a member of the Ministerial Council on HIV AIDS and a member of the Public Health Association of Nova Scotia. Jackie will be speaking with us today on criminalization of HIV non-disclosure, a public health or legal matter. Please join me in welcoming you. I was hoping for less of a full house considering the weather, uh, and it is Friday after all, but um, welcome everybody having said that. Um, Thank you for joining us for this presentation today on the discussion of criminalization of non-disclosure and whether or not HIV ought to be framed as a public health or legal matter, particularly in light of the recent Supreme Court decision. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the Health Law Institute and in particular Elaine Gibson for inviting me here to speak to you today on the issue of framing HIV non-disclosure uh, as a public health or legal issue. Um, as noted, I've been involved in the HIV AIDS movement in some capacity uh, or other, mostly in research and advocacy for some 20 years. And uh, as such, I've followed with great interest the evolving responses at various levels from community, public health, and research and have marveled at the incredible advances we've made on the one hand in moving an HIV diagnosis from a certain death sentence to the contested terrain of a chronic illness, largely as a result of the introduction of new, highly effective HIV treatments in the mid-1990s. Sorry, it's really, it, I mean, it's got to be minus 100 out there, so my nose is a little bit runny, so pardon me if I have to uh, take a moment to blow it every now and again. Um, I was a master's student presenting my research in 1996 at the International AIDS Conference when it was held in Vancouver and noted the much anticipated excitement around the discovery of what was, at least at the time, touted as the cure for HIV. Interestingly, all of the hype that came around the International AIDS Conference um, was quite incredible and quite palpable at the time. The benefit of hindsight, um, as is the case today in 2013, um, we, we can see that these treatments were not the magic bullet and would not allow us to get ahead of the epidemic in isolation from other issues. Specifically, these new HIV treatments were complex, required great tenacity on the part of the patient to adhere to the clinical guidelines, which meant adherence to 90% or higher levels in order to fully benefit. And for those who were able to adhere, these treatments came with a variety of treatment failures and toxicity <coughs> issues, which contributed to a variety of comorbid conditions. As a health researcher working in the field of HIV prevention and treatment, I was interested in knowing how adherence to HIV treatment was impacted by other social determinants of health, and as Elaine has pointed out, gender being a key determinant of health. As, uh, some of these determinants of health don't fit nicely into the Public Health Agency of Canada framing of determinants of health. So in the early days, we're dealing with determinants of health such as degree of outness about one's HIV status, about the complexity of medication regimens, which require strict timing of doses, nutritional considerations, refrigeration, and simply the sheer burden of pills required on a daily basis. In other words, not a magic bullet. 
So uh, part one, this is sort of a three-part talk. Um, and I have heeded Elaine's advice to sort of um, balance the public health perspective with the legal perspective. So if you like the presentation, thank Elaine. If you don't like it, talk to Elaine. Um, <laughs> so there'll be three parts. So let's start with uh, part one. So just, just go along with me as I tell you this story, because some of you may look at this slide and say, why are we having this conversation? So what I'd like to do then by way of introduction is to offer a framing of the HIV AIDS pandemic through the lens of some of the worst pandemics we've experienced, such as smallpox, the great flu of 1918, malaria, tuberculosis, cholera, etc. It's interesting to note that all of these pandemics came with their own unique biopsychosocial heuristics. The purpose of this historical nod to key pandemics as a jumping off point for this discussion today about whether HIV is a public health issue or a legal issue is the recognition that we have as part of this collective human project struggled around the globe to balance these various health crises with evidence-informed approaches uh, and responses and more recently with recognition of the more contextual determinants of health that serve to drive these various pandemics. Although deaths have occurred in the millions due to these pandemics, and in many cases, unfortunately, we continue to see significant mortality and morbidity associated with one or more of these pandemics, there remain a number of unresolved public health, legal, and social questions about what is the best way to tackle these issues. HIV AIDS, uh, I would argue, unlike many of these other earlier public health issues, has some unique characteristics not seen among other pandemics, and this is important for today's discussion. The early history of HIV AIDS, at least in the North American context, speaks to our collective dis-ease with issues associated with homosexuality, of injection drug use, of sex work, and of the moral sorting of those who rank among unfortunate versus deserving victims of HIV infection. The very etiology or causation associated with HIV, at least in the North American context, suggests that the un underlying factors contributing to escalating infection rates could be altered through strategic public health interventions. For example, access to and uptake of HIV testing, partner notification, the availability and use of condoms, and more recently and perhaps more controversially, the use of HIV treatment as a form of HIV prevention. You've probably heard Julio Montaner's group in BC, the sort of um, Stop AIDS project, which is essentially get everybody on treatment as a way of reducing the community level of infectivity, and that way you get rid of the virus, essentially. So it is a controversial uh, public health intervention, so keep that in mind. Um, it's interesting to note that while we are seeing what some would refer to as an erosion of the notion of AIDS exceptionalism, we are seeing a simultaneous shifting of HIV as a public health issue to that of a legal issue. With respect to this particular talk, the use of criminal sanctions, it could be argued, is occurring where more traditional public health approaches are regarded as not having been sufficiently effective in stopping the spread of HIV. If we take from the word etiology, as used in medical theories and public health, how we study the cause of HIV and the reasons behind the spread of the virus, we must, I would argue, attempt to balance the approaches we take to amassing our evidence base, or, so the question before you today is, essentially this, is HIV a public health or a legal matter? I'll start my talk with the role and function of public health, and if all goes as planned, I will end with the recent framing of the Supreme Court decision of Canada on criminalization of non-disclosure of HIV. My hope is by the end of my talk, we can have an open dialogue about the relative pros and cons of each position. And before I go any further, just a gentle reminder to everybody in the room, I am not a lawyer. So if there are really hard questions for the law people, ask Elaine. Um, my purpose is, as I see it, to provide you with information about both public health and legal perspectives so that this conversation can occur beyond the confines of this room and create a broader conversation back to your respective classrooms, workplaces, and communities. Everybody ready? Okay. 
Um, while early responses to various pandemics can appear in retrospect, somewhat lacking in rigor and scientific evidence that by today's standards would be a prerequisite uh, to developing definitive statements about etiology, course of treatment, obviously where available, social or legal sanctions, and yet at the very least serve as a means of developing a discourse about the association between the presumed cause and impact on health, health outcomes. Rather, We know now with the advantage of hindsight that many of the early epidemics were related to factors such as proximity of animals to humans, including those used in the context of farming or in the case of domesticated animals, increasing level, levels of, of settlement, travel, trade, storage of food, and with these advances, the widespread expansion of sanitation needs and the increase in wells and ditches, no big surprise, all of which in turn created pools of standing water that allowed for the proliferation of disease-carrying mosquitoes, as well as an inviting habitat for other disease-carrying animals such as rats and mice. Throughout history, we've seen the impact of global travel on the increasing exposure to new microbes. Uh, in response, public health has, as part of its remit, undertaken to address the spread of disease, the control of outbreaks, the surveillance of such outbreaks, etc. We know from the World Health Organization definition of health that health is clearly more than the absence of disease. Rather, and I quote, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, end quote. It is noteworthy that this WHO globally accepted definition of health has not been amended since 1948. In essence, public health in Canada, as we know it, aims to assure the conditions for people to be healthy. We know that in Canada we have a well-structured public health system that takes the lead on a wide range of health policies and programs from immunization through inspection, all with an eye to promoting and protecting the public's health. More specifically with respect to HIV and AIDS, under the federal initiative to address AIDS, the Public Health Agency of Canada, or affectionately known as the FACERS, um, in partnership with Health Canada, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and Correctional Service Canada work together for, and I quote, a Canada free from HIV and AIDS and the underlying conditions, this is important, so listen to this, and the underlying conditions that make Canadians vulnerable to the epidemic. In addition, Public Health Agency of Canada is responsible for HIV AIDS communication, social marketing, national and global programs, policy development, surveillance, laboratory science, and global engagement focusing on technical assistance and policy advice." End quote. Uh, we know that in Canada, uh, we have provinces and territories that are responsible for the delivery of health care and public health services. This is, I would argue, one of the many key challenges in a coordinated approach to HIV prevention, care, treatment and support across this country. Just a few numbers to share with you. With respect to this contentious issue of the undiagnosed um, uh, numbers of HIV infection in Canada, this is a very important issue in relation to the criminalization uh, of HIV non-disclosure in that if you're not being tested for HIV and you're unaware of your HIV status, there is no disclosure to be made. What this graph shows is that a total of 74,174 positive HIV test results have been reported to the Public Health Agency of Canada's Center for Communicable Disease and Infection Control since testing began in November of 1985 through December 31st, 2011. The CCDIC estimates that there were a cumulative total of 77,620 persons diagnosed with HIV, the prerequisite being that they actually were tested. Um, the C CCDIC estimates that approximately 24,300 individuals have died. So what we're doing is a little subtraction exercise, 77,620 minus 24,300 Canadians. Uh, were therefore aware of their status. Since the, total since the estimated total of 
300 persons living with HIV in Canada, the remaining 17,980 persons, or approximately 25% of prevalent cases, were unaware of their HIV status. So, back to the issue of disclosure. Just tuck that little nugget away for our discussions. In terms of the overall estimated number of HIV cases, this differs by exposure categories. And this is important to look at um, when, you, when you see these, follow these blue lines. So MSM means men who have sex with men. The uh, red line is injection drug use. The sort of, I'm not sure what color that is. Whatever this color is. Lime, okay, so lime, uh, heterosexual, uh, and then uh, purple is heterosexual. Um, Non-endemic, endemic. Do people understand the difference between that? No. So if you come from a um, non-endemic country, so you're coming from a, you may be an immigrant uh, from a country where HIV is endemic, so we know that in um, a variety of, of contexts there are high um, concentrations of HIV infection. So the, the reporting system is sort of reporting folks from endemic countries versus those who are not, and that their only known risk factor is heterosexual sex. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So with approximately 24 or so percent of people living with HIV infection in the MSM IDU category, um, unaware of their HIV status, whereas there was a higher proportion of people who were unaware of their HIV status, approximately 34 percent in the heterosexual category that's combining um, endemic and, and non-endemic heterosexual risk. Okay, so keep that in mind. So there are people who don't have any identifiable risk factors other than heterosexual sex. Okay. From this graph, uh, you can see that the number of reported HIV positive tests have remained fairly constant between 1996 and 2001. I'm gonna put a little shame on public health um, sidebar in there. Um, so what we'd like to have seen, since we've had some 30 years of practice to get ahead of the epidemic, what we'd like to see is a trend where the numbers are actually in a steady decline, but we're not seeing that. So is that an artifact of more access to testing, more people heeding the public health mantra of get tested, know your status? What is that an artifact of? Something for you to think about. In terms of rates of HIV positive test reports among adults by province and territory, there are a number of hard hit locations which speak to the unique contextual factors that vary from location to location. Some would argue that these differing rates across the country are related to issues uh, about population density, as well as provincial variability in access to testing, uptake rates in terms of HIV testing, and variability in terms of access to prevention interventions from condoms to clean needles to methadone. And again, keeping in mind that those are provincial responsibilities, right? So, uh, In terms of how HIV is distributed by age, you can see from this graph the differences between males and females in terms of age distribution. There are potential implications for women within reproductive age, particularly in, in regard to the spike you can see in the 30 to 39 year age category, suggesting that many of these women may have become infected at a younger age and may have been diagnosed in the context of prenatal HIV screening programs. Prenatal screening for women across the country is recommended by the Canadian Medical Association as a means of preventing vertical transmission of the virus from the mother to the fetus. There are no such targeted screening interventions for heterosexual men, whereas gay men or men who have sex with men have, historically speaking, had a much higher rate of HIV testing uh, uptake in Canada. In terms of the proportion of reported AIDS cases among adults by race, ethnicity, we can see from this graph that, for example, Aboriginal populations are grossly overrepresented relative to their overall population size. And this is a particular uh, public health concern where current HIV prevention interventions may not be meeting the unique socioeconomic, cultural, gender, or linguistic needs of more diverse populations. These determinants of health, according to the Public Health Agency of Canada, and for those of you, those of you who have read Dennis Raphael's work, these determinants of health can synergistically impact on both health risks or health context, as well as health outcomes. 
We know from a public health perspective that key determinants of health can impact on health-seeking behavior, which is to say that based on the configuration of determinants of health, some of which you can hopefully see in that schematic, uh, individuals may be more or less likely to seek out health services, including HIV testing. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada, determinants of health at the micro, meso, and macro levels, as indicated in this schematic, are interconnected and impact on health across the lifespan. It's important to note here that not all of these determinants of health are modifiable. For example, as much as some of us might like to modify our actual age to something perhaps lower, uh, that is not a, modifi mod not a modifiable determinant of health, whereas work environments are modifiable in that workplace safety regulations, labor standards, and policies can impact on health, and they, and they are modifiable. So everybody kind of with me on that? Yes? All right. Okay, so banking all that information, I'm going to carry it forward into part two. So now let's have a look more specifically at public health and the law. And again, just a gentle disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so um, according, accordingly, the continuum of approaches to meeting diverse HIV prevention needs is subject to the context within which public health occurs. However, coercion is regarded as a dividing line, if you will, between voluntary public health measures and public health law interventions that are backed by law. According to the Interagency Coalition on AIDS and Development, criminal law and some interventions under public law rely on coercion. Shifting gears slightly, public health law consists of several core characteristics, including public health activities central to government responsibilities, relationships between the state and the populations the state serves, the provision of population-based services as informed by scientific evidence, and finally, the power to coerce for the protection of the public's health. So, there is within the public health remit what's referred to as a graduate, graduated approach. And this is an interesting model in that it begins with an initial complaint from an individual, such as a public health personnel like a diagnosing nurse, who brings to the attention of a medical officer of health or an MOH for, um, for information about the client who is unable or unwilling to prevent the tr transmission of HIV. It's the responsibility of the MOH to document the details, to confirm an HIV diagnosis, to determine whether the client received appropriate counseling at the time of diagnosis. The MOH then assesses this information in conjunction with the diagnosing nurse, if the client has the knowledge and capacity to comply. That's essentially what they're trying to establish at this point. Does the individual have the knowledge and capacity to, to comply? The client may be, de may be deemed unable to prevent HIV transmission for what are referred to as internal reasons, such as organic mental illness, or external reasons, such as coercion from other persons. Or the client may be unwilling to prevent HIV transmission due to high-risk behaviors, but possesses the capacity to prevent transmission. So again, this is, uh, this is within the remit of the MOH. So moving on then to level one, this involves counseling and education, whereby the diagnosing nurse provides education and monitoring, referrals to care and treatment, and discussion about legal issues. So that's happening at level one. At level two, this requires a diagnosing nurse to assist the client in accessing food, housing, counseling, health care, and treatment, and also involves regular reviews uh, with the client. At level three, we see the MOH is, is again made aware that the risk continues and an issue uh, an issues an order under section 29 of the Public Health Act which in and of itself involves two steps the first step which uh, contains the conditions of HIV disclosure protection of partner no sharing of needles no donation of blood or tissue notification of residents and regular meeting with a diagnosing nurse the second part of that is if unwilling or unable behaviors persist Despite the order uh, and intervention, further limits are placed on the client's behavior, such as prohibiting activities that may place other individuals at risk and restrictions on where the person may go. Uh, moving up one level, level 4A is an apprehension order, level 4B is an isolation order, and the last, which is level 5, is the criminal level. 
Okay, so you've got all of these systems in place in this graduated model within public health. At level five, at the criminal level, uh, the client may be charged under the Public Health Act and or the criminal code. What I want to show you um, in this schematic is that as we see public health approaches shift from attempting to meet the complex challenges of preventing HIV risk behavior, we see a moving away from voluntary to mandatory interventions as depicted in the schematic. With this comes increasing intensity of case management and increasing coercion and increase in costs. This is the point at which public health powers can essentially be turned over to criminal powers in addressing HIV prevention. However, based on the findings put forth by the Federal Provincial Territorial Expert Working Group on the issue of persons who fail to disclose their HIV status, they suggest that, public health, that a public health approach as opposed to a criminal approach provides greater scope for prevention, confidentiality is maintained to a greater extent, there's less stigmatization of the person living with HIV, and that HIV is less likely to be driven underground uh, in a public health approach versus a criminal approach. Um, most of you probably recognize this photo. It was when the, when the uh, Supreme Court case was on all of the newspapers and everywhere, this was their photo of choice, so you've probably seen it many, many times in relation to this particular issue uh, about the, the recent Supreme Court decision um, with reference to the October 5th, 2012 Supreme Court decision. The challenge in this case, in part, is in defining when there is realistic possibility of HIV transmission. So as we kind of walk through this mental exercise, put yourself in the position of the person who is having to prove this, right? So how do you know, how do you provide proof um, uh, that there was a realistic possibility of HIV transmission, okay? So just walk along with me in this scenario. So. What this means is that to address the issue of realistic possibility, both a condom must be used and the person living with HIV must have a low or undetectable HIV viral load through the use and adherence to antiretroviral therapy. If both of these conditions are met, there is no obligation under the criminal law to disclose one's HIV status. However, proving that both conditions were met can be problematic, as you can appreciate. Okay, so from the Supreme Court decision, the issue of realistic possibility of HIV transmission is problematized only in relation to vaginal sex. The court has not clarified how the requirement to disclose applies in the case of anal sex or oral sex, for example. The scientific evidence to determine risk of transmission of HIV in the case of unprotected vaginal sex uh, where ejaculation occurs and where the, HIV, where the male partner is HIV positive ranges from 0.05% or 1 in 2,000 to 0.26 or 1 in 384. Sorry? Do you want me to get me some Kleenex? Oh, you thank you. Some? No, that, I, I thought I did. This is good. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Cut. That's a wrap. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, Uh, okay. Further, everybody still with me? Don't make me throw this at you. Um, further, the risk of transmission is reduced up to 96% when the HIV positive partner is on antiretroviral medication. It's noteworthy that from the initial 1989 Courier decision to the 2012 uh, maybe your in DC decision, advances in HIV treatment and viral load testing have changed the evidence base of transmission probability, I would argue. Uh, so as we can see in this graph, there have been a total of 123 HIV non-disclosure cases in Canada between 1989 and 2011. Of these, 65 have been convicted while many are still before the courts. And this is information that you can get from the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. Uh, Richard Elliott has done a lot of work in this area. The majority of these charges have been against a male partner who refused 
or failed to inform their female partner that they were HIV positive before sexual intercourse and or did not use a condom during sexual intercourse. Okay. If we agree that the intent of criminalization of HIV non-disclosure is meant to protect public health and human rights, the question remains if the recent Supreme Court decision will advance public health or serve as a disincentive for individuals to be tested for HIV and that it may have the untoward consequence of further pushing HIV underground. Further, the suggestion from organizations like the Legal Network and the Interagency Coalition on AIDS and Development is to revisit the possibility of an either-or scenario. And this is where either the use of a condom or an undetectable viral load could preclude criminal liability in cases of HIV non-disclosure. The suggestion is to further, uh, to further weigh the current scientific evidence against the likelihood of infection as well as the potential unintended impacts of criminalization of HIV non-disclosure in determining an approach that does not undermine the three decades, plus or minus, of public health uh, HIV policy and programming interventions. In particular, the, the concern from public health about the reduction in HIV testing rights, rates rather, due to the perception of um, knowing your status means telling your status, and as I described earlier, that's not always the case. Oh, thanks, Elaine. Appreciate that. Uh, okay, so what does this mean then in terms of the approximately 25% of the undiagnosed fraction of the population who are unaware of their HIV status? So in other words, will the possibility of criminal sanctions increase or decrease the likelihood of individuals getting tested for HIV and where found to be HIV positive uh, will infected individuals be more likely or less likely to discuss HIV prevention strategies with health care providers? What are the potential implications for care and treatment of people living with HIV in the face of criminalization? Uh, we know that the intersection uh, of determinants of health can impact not only on initial HIV vulnerability, but it could also be argued that these same determinants of health impact on health outcomes. So in an effort to capture these contextual factors which contribute to HIV infection rates, it can be argued that the public health policies and procedures related to using the graduated approach, which I explained to you earlier, in conjunction with mental health, social work, medical services, and community health care, allows for interventions at the level at which the unique circumstances pose the primary risk of initial infection. Okay. Okay. Some further considerations to frame our discussion that we may want to consider how criminalization may increase stigma and discrimination, hinder HIV prevention efforts, and I've already alluded to the issue around uh, testing and the problematic therein, contradict public health messages, could be used as a tool to intimidate partner, or, sorry, and intimate partner abuse issues. Uh, it's not based necessarily on current HIV research, and I've alluded to some of the changes from the 1989 decision to the 2012 decision, and it doesn't necessarily get at the root problems associated with HIV risk. So in Canada, a person living with HIV can be prosecuted for not disclosing their HIV status before engaging in sexual activity that represents a significant risk of HIV transmission. So the, for the purposes of our discussion today, I would ask that you consider that people can be prosecuted even if the sexual partner was not infected. Okay? So and further, that criminal law can be applied to exposure and not just actual transmission. That's an important issue to keep in mind. We're almost, uh, we're almost there. Uh, from a public health perspective, I would ask that you consider the following points uh, in, in your discussion, both here, but also back in your respective workplaces and classrooms. Prevention is the cornerstone of the Canadian public health response, which necessitates prevention interventions at all levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, and must also consider the intersectionality of determinants of health that can lead to contexts of risk for HIV infection. 
and that to be most successful, public health policy and programming interventions must utilize a range of interventions, biomedical, behavioral, structural, et cetera. So as stated in my presentation today, HIV does continue to be a significant public health issue, despite various notable successes, both primary and secondary prevention remain ongoing challenges. So some possible uh, ways forward include improving our understanding of biomedical, behavioral, social, structural drivers, um, particularly as they inform uh, the public health response vis-a-vis -vis, uh, health programs and policies. The evolution of the approach, so again, we're seeing an erosion to uh, what's been called historically AIDS exceptionalism and getting rid of uh, funding that is targeted uh, specifically and solely in HIV AIDS and looking at combining that with uh, sexually transmitted blood-borne infections and tuberculosis, tuberculosis which is actually the, the perspective that the Public Health Agency of Canada is entertaining. And collaborative approaches obviously are needed between governments across sectors, um, including people living with HIV. And finally, a collaborative approach, as I said, is really key to um, getting ahead of the epidemic, both in Canada as well as globally. So by way of conclusion, I'd like to turn the conversation over to you to grapple with the question that we're here today to discuss, namely, is HIV a public health or criminal matter? And more to the point, how do you weigh the evidence, some of which is seemingly contradictory, in determining which approach is better suited to address HIV prevention in the Canadian context. Thank you. Can I, can I just do one shameless plug? Okay, two quick ones. Um, <laughs> Alex Hillman, right there, she's just about there she is, um, is actually my research manager in my research unit and we are uh, developing a, um, uh, an event in conjunction with the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, which will be held at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia on Saturday, March the 9th. And it's uh, Lunch and Learn, and we're going to be showing a film about this issue of HIV um, criminalization for non-disclosure. And then we're having uh, food, and we're also having a, an art installation, uh, which is done collectively by a group of positive women um, and a local aid service organization, and it's open to the public, it's free. Uh, we've got a Facebook event thing, so like it, send it around, whatever. Um, if you want any more information about that event, you can contact um, Alex and her, I hope that's 2213 is correct. <coughs> we had 7806 or something before, but got that all sorted out. And the, the last one is, um, is anybody here specifically working in HIV? and or going to the Canadian Association of HIV Research Conference in Vancouver. Okay, then that I don't need to get into. So that's, that's it. So I, I'll turn it over to you to uh, ask questions and engage uh, one another in a conversation about this particular uh, issue. Oh, hi. Um, uh, What, in your opinion, theoretically, does this director to criminal sanction add? You know, why is it, why do we have this feeling that it's important to have uh, a separate criminal sanction that we can get to directly when we can already get there through the public health route? Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I'm curious as to what, you, what problematic or helpful mm -hmm. addition you think that makes. Um, from my own perspective as a professor of health promotion, I struggle with that because our focus is largely on uh, primary and secondary prevention, so much more upstream with the focus on energies, resources, etc., in preventing initial infections and then preventing um, onward infections and looking at how we can do that from a systems approach. And, and in our work, and Alex, you can feel free to chime in, um, it's, it's not about looking at um, the, the big hammer of the criminal law to sort out something that from our perspective we still do see as within the remit of public health and not necessarily, do, do you remember that sort of toggle between 
it's a public health issue, but within the Public Health Act, there is the choice or the opportunity to then toggle over into the criminal um, uh, criminal justice. And from my perspective, um, it, it's it's a bit counter to the work that we do in, in health promotion. So, yeah. Other questions? Did anybody else want to answer that? Or feel free. There should be a conversation, not just, you know, question about uh, the HIV research community with respect to the Make the Earth case. Uh -huh. So uh, what kind of evidence were they putting in? Who was there? And why, you know, why, because I think everybody was expecting the case to go the other way, yeah. potentially because of the research, that we're in such a different world now, how could they possibly reaffirm? Yeah. So what could you explain other than, you know, just sheer negligence on the part of the court to, right, to explain how you could have ignored this aspect of the worldview change in HIV. Yeah. So, so in the case of Mabier, there were there were four charges brought against him uh, around non-disclosure, and uh, three of the four stuck, uh, and the fourth one didn't because his viral load was low. So there's so interestingly, and that was the uh, Manitoba Supreme Court. So at the provincial level, they decided to. Uh, do away with one of the charges, but still that evidence of the other three were used in the Supreme Court discussion. In terms of interveners, uh, for those of you who, who are uh, aware of the work that the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network um, and other like HALCO and others um, in Ontario actually were invited to, to uh, participate in the process as interveners, but you're right, they and, and other uh, uh, other individuals involved in that process were, you know, would share your your um, uh, concern about that, and it was a it was a, a zero to nine decision, right? So there, it was a unanimous decision. So the the question from some of the interveners was, as you're posing, given this vast amount of <coughs> scientific evidence that didn't exist in 1989 with the Courier decision, why are we not making better use of that evidence? to frame uh, decisions and discussions about that. It gets a little bit more complex with respect to um, the nature of the DC um, uh, case where, and this is a, a woman from Quebec, where uh, she had one um, instance of unprotected sex with her male partner. They subsequently broke up. He used that to charge her uh, with aggravated sexual assault. Um, it was later proven that her viral load was undetectable, so she theoretically posed no risk of transmission of the virus. So it's, it's an interesting kind of um, shoehorning of, of logic when on the one hand, the likelihood of transmission is negligible, but the, the um, intent of the law in this case is to, this person is guilty of a criminal offense, which aggravated sexual assault is a criminal offense. So the concern from people like Richard Elliott is, are we then muddying the water, like making a law that's on the books not good for either the person who is actually a victim of sexual assault as well as a person who is living with HIV. So they would argue that in, in neither instance is it a perfect application of that particular law. But please feel free to chime in, people. That's all I got. Um, and I think it, it ties into other questions and to the way that you presented it. Uh, it is why would so nobody would disagree that we should have all the public health prevention measures that we can and mm -hmm. pump all the money into that and that's great and wonderful. And then we have someone who all those prevention measures and all the protection measures have not touched, and that person is um, intent on yeah. transmitting HIV to others without their knowledge. And why the heck would we not use the law at this point? And I'm not clear yet either on whether <coughs> you think that the public health law coercive measures are worth utilizing, um, and uh, you know you, you were presenting them on a continuum. So, if we have a continuum of public health measures, whether they're contained within public health legislation itself, or whether they go over into the criminal code, mm -hmm. why the heck not? Yeah, 
Um, so the issue around intentionality is really important. So the, the I mean, and there's lots of material available on this, that if the person did it, was doing this intentionally, that's a very different, you know, they've been told don't do it, they continue to do it, they have the mental capacity to understand um, the consequences of their actions and they're still doing it willfully and intentionally. Um, that's a very, 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 very minute segment of the population. And I would argue, if somebody knows they, and I know, and just work with me on this, if somebody knows they have a sexually transmitted infection like syphilis or herpes or gonorrhea or fill in the blank, the question remains, why are they not then being there willfully? They know they have it. They're not doing anything to take precautions. So what is it about HIV that becomes this extraordinary um, situation that people can't sort of disentangle the, yes, this person did it intentionally, in other cases, we can see the the um, uh, the use of public health cease and desist orders, or people being incarcerated temporarily because they won't stop doing what they're doing. That issue of intentionality, I would argue, goes across a whole slew of behaviors, and so the picking out HIV in relation to all of these other things, that there is an intent to do harm to somebody else, why then is HIV the focus of all of this psychic and other energies? For me, that's still a, a question that I'm, I'm grappling with. We're putting a lot of money and resources into um, a, a fix that doesn't actually get at the underlying issues that are, that are at hand, I would argue. Well, but can't I just say in response, well, fine, we'll include syphilis and gonorrhea and any of the more serious <coughs> STIs in, in that um, coercive measures area there. Do you think that some coercive measures are appropriate? Um, so, um, the camera's still rolling. Um, <laughs> so, I'm going to say yes and no. And I'm going to say yes and no because from, from health promotion, it doesn't resonate with the, the core philosophy of what health promotion is attempting to do. From a broader public health remit, yes, I think in some instances, particularly around the issue of intentionality, then yes, some coercive measures under public health might be um, necessary or required. Um, Hi, anybody over there in the cheap seats? What do you know? Anybody else? I have another one. <laughs> anybody else? Anybody? Help me out here. Yes, no, this will be your punch easier. Right? Yeah. It is about um, do we? What do we know about why people do not know their status? Okay, so we know that there are approximately 25 percent of people in Canada with HIV that don't know their status. So do you remember I used the example of women are often found to be positive through prenatal <coughs> screening, right? So that's a catchment that's been used, I would say, universally as a means of uh, preventing vertical transmission of the virus from the mother to, to the fetus. And there were studies that were done on this a long time ago that even monotherapy um, at delivery would reduce the chances of the baby becoming infected. So that, that tool has been um, there for a very long time. There has not been, and don't shoot me, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say this even though the camera's rolling, um, there is no comparable for heterosexual men. So for example, some of the studies that I've done um, in Nova Scotia and elsewhere looking at why people don't get tested. So what's the perception about um, uh, you know, why people would get tested and why they wouldn't? And there's a whole range of things. But one of the interesting things that we heard from, uh, from pregnant women was no one ever asked for their, so they get tested to prevent vertical transmission, right? So they want to make sure if they know the mom is positive, they can put her on antiretroviral therapy, reduce the, uh, the chances of vertical transmission down to virtually nothing, um, but no one, and, and all of the women without probing on my part said, I thought it was really curious that I get asked that only, A, only when I'm pregnant, and B, never in association with my male partner. So f there are some gaps in testing campaigns that I would suggest need to include in a user-friendly, gender-appropriate way heterosexual males. So gay men or men who have sex with men historically are good to get tested. 
pregnant women. Very few will, uh, will not get tested. And the way the Canadian Medical Association guidelines are currently uh, stated is you get asked in your first trimester if you say no, you get asked in your second trimester if you say no, you get asked in your third trimester. So you've got multiple opportunities to, um, to get at that potential undiagnosed population of, of, uh, of women, so women who are, who are pregnant. We, I would argue and have argued for a really long time that we need to do more about engaging heterosexual men in this discussion. Where we see heterosexual men included in these discussions is largely uh, their face on the front of the paper saying, you know, Buddy X had sex with all of these people. There was an outbreak when I was a grad student working at the Center for Disease Control or LCDC in Ottawa and the, the, the outbreak was in Conception Bay, Newfoundland. So all the the surveillance people go to find out what's happening, and it's one prolific fornicator who uh, apparently knew of his status and continued to have sex. So we really don't have a great mechanism to engage populations beyond uh, women in prenatal context and, um, uh, and men who have sex with men. So I think we could do more in terms of how we approach testing. So there's really no incentive now, I would argue, in light of this recent Supreme Court decision for people to be tested because you see the words HIV and criminalization in the same sentence or in the same paragraph um, and it immediately raises concerns about why would I want to get tested? I don't want to know that. There was a, there was a question here. Um, yeah, I, was just kind of some uh, I think one of the things is the nature of the disease itself, especially for other STIs, is the fact that you can be completely asymptomatic yeah. the entire time you carry them, so whether or not you even really have them can be Again, like you mentioned, kind of that the screening screening is there, but who's getting this? Yeah. A lot of people don't even know they have the disease to begin with. It's completely asymptomatic with them. Switch what you just. And there's a lot of STDs uh, um, and HIV as well that people can go for a very long period of time completely asymptomatic. So again, there's nothing sort of tweaking them to get tested. So that's a good point. There was a question here? Yeah, I was just going to ask around. Um, how criminalization would, would impact people who would otherwise have gotten tested, but would would not get tested now because of the fear of criminalization. And what is there any empirical data or research? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a really good uh, question. We're actually starting um, in Nova Scotia a rapid point of care HIV testing pilot project, and we're looking at two populations at enhanced risk for HIV infection and actually offering them conventional test or rapid HIV point of care test, which means you essentially get your test result um, in, the same, in the same meeting. And if it's positive, then it would be sent forward for a confirmatory um, test. And I think that's actually going to be one of the, the issues that we look at is um, are people uh, declining testing offers more as a result of this? So, you know, we can track that. Um, for example, in, in Nova Scotia, we don't have super duper great testing uptake rate data other than through the prenatal screening programs. So I think that's a, that's a question that we, we ought to be paying a lot of attention to, for sure. Yeah. The other thing that I would wonder if it comes into play is yeah, males are traditionally not seen in the right <coughs> between you know, late adolescence through until, I don't know, I think it's between birth and death. <laughs> so, yeah, so that that's a piece whereas women tend to be seen maybe a bit more often. Yes. I get the date on that, but so that would potentially drop the um, opportunity for interface yeah. right off the top. So sure. that surely would increase um, the the numbers there in terms of people not yeah. being present to be asked. Yeah. Um, and the other piece I wonder about. It, this is just curious on my part, is how comfortable are primary care practitioners, be they physicians, nurse practitioners, or whomever, yeah. in looking at a known heterosexual male mm -hmm. and saying, have you had HIV testing done? Super interesting questions, and I think that is uh, something that we need to pay more attention to. We need to pay more attention to men's health issues across the board and not just HIV. So you can look at things like, okay, how many of you have had this experience? You're driving along, and there's a city bus in front of you, and you're just chatting away with somebody in the seat beside you, and you get stuck behind the same bus the whole way, and the back of the bus has a big black and white butt cheek about what? Getting your bits and bobs checked, 
and it's aimed, and it's and it's it's uh, what? Right, that's the one. And so, so that that's changing the sort of public discourse about guys dropping their trousers, maybe just long enough to have things checked out for a minute or two, and then off they go. So I think that that um, the approach to normalizing screening and testing for, for men is a really important part of the HIV uh, piece, but it's also a really important part for men's and women's health across the board because your, your observation is quite right. Women will often go in and get information or condoms or other things for their male partners, um, and male partners often don't feel comfortable going in unless it's falling off or bleeding or something. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I, I have to speak, but I, I saw that very clearly. I worked back in the Arctic for oh, yes. a while, and that was probably the biggest, most glaring um, glitch sure. in, in yeah. the primary health care scene. There was yeah. the almost, ab, almost complete absence of men in the clinics, right? Yeah. Until they were 75. Yeah, and then stuff starts yeah. to go wrong, and they need, they need a lot of care. So, you know, I think there's a lot that can be done around the upstream approach to screening. There was a hand up there somewhere. No? No? There was anybody else? Wow. Yes? I was wondering if you could go back to the point you made about the, uh, the criminal code and the covering of actual sex and how that's playing out for uh, home sex work. Sure. Um, good question. Um, I was actually this morning looking at statistics of who is, who is uh, charging whom with what kinds of whatever. And most of it's heterosexual charges. Um, and you would think that given the rates of infection among men who have sex with men, that there'd be a lot more of that going on, but there's not. Um, so it's kind of an interesting phenomenon to, to look at because what, I mean, what, what does that say? So gay men are better at sorting it out themselves. They don't trust the criminal justice system. You know, they're okay with barebacking and sort of thorough sorting amongst themselves, and that's a sufficient, um, sufficiently informed approach. Um, so I mean, it, it's an interesting. It's a it, it's a very interesting question because the courts didn't weigh in on um, oral sex or anal sex. Um, and the focus was on, on vaginal sex because in most instances those are the cases that are, are coming before the court. And also there's a greater risk of transmission from uh, an infected male to a female versus infected female to a male, depending on the circumstances of, yeah. Um, but generally speaking, yeah. Are they, are they still trying to create legislation to cover the other forms of sex or are they, you know, if you really, got it covered, this is all we need to make I think it would be very interesting to see what the Supreme Court justices do on their downtime after they make these kinds of decisions. You know, do they then have informal talks like, hey, you know, we should really get back together and, you know, have a more fulsome conversation about insects. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how the, I don't know what the, you know, I don't know what the, what the impetus would be, but I, I think it, it, it's actually quite interesting. And the, and the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network is actually questioning that. Um, if the test is, the evidence is there for uh, probabil probability of transmission through oral sex, um, anal sex, and vaginal sex, can we get a little bit more, either, either weigh in on this issue of transmission um, through injection drug use, because people share needles, so, you know, where does the remit to apply this um, transmission issue, um, uh, where does it end, or, you know, is this actually the way we should be going? I, I, would, I would ask that question, too. Um. Hi. Hi. Um, I work at the Others of Care in the lab, so we do this HIV screening. And I've often wondered that myself, we never see any males, or very seldom. But why do they never, when a couple decide to have a lab, why do they never ask the male to be screened? I mean, wouldn't that be the excellent opportunity? Yeah, I mean, it, it, would, uh, it would be, and in fact, most of the women that we interviewed in our uh, HIV counseling and testing studies, both nationally and provincially, asked that same question. You know, I didn't get pregnant sitting at home watching late night movies. I, I mean, but that's yeah. a good opportunity to have that discussion. For sure. I would assume that most of them would be agreeable to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no I, I, I think that's a really interesting uh, question about how to include 
um, more um, heterosexual males in the last couple of centuries for sure. I know Lynette is at the back and she was being very patient. I, I, can we hear one last from Lynette? Sure. No pressure. Make it good, Lynette. Make it count. Uh, there's, a, there's an aspect of this uh, that I've always wished I understood better. Uh, it's more on the legal side, so. Okay, over to you. But it's in relation to, as I understand it, I think Canada's criminalization is more intense than most other countries. And it's through this mechanism of what is informed consent for sex. And it's not through legal mechanisms that would look at harm or intention to harm. Um, so I, I just want to that a little bit better is, is, and the peculiarities about that. I mean, if you just talk about violations of standards of consent and sex, and it's not really about harm or intention to harm, then it would seem that, you know, we've got sexual assault going on all over the place. Yeah. Because we can lie about all sorts of things, or fail to expose all sorts of things that would matter to the partners. And so then you really have not just HIV being picked up in the number of infectious conditions, but HIV being picked up of all of the factors in which we are not officers not yeah. sexual relationships. So I just but I don't don't understand. It's, it's an issue of fraud where there are options in the law is very more law to well, more closely on our protection. Do you want to talk it's the issue of uh, officiating consent and then it's it constitutes fraud. Right, so it's actually been a development within the courts, not only in criminal law, but in civil law more generally, um, to, to be asking whether um, the transmission of a sexually transmitted disease with knowledge that it may be being transmitted through, an, um, through a sexual act, whether that vitiates the consent of the person who is um, the victim in the circumstances. And the courts have gradually moved over centuries um, to uh, a, a finding by Canadian courts that um, it does actually vitiate consent if you have not revealed to the other person um, the presence of a sexually transmitted disease and the fact that it may be transmitted if protection is not taken. Um, so that is not only in the criminal cases, but you're entirely correct that in my understanding, the use of the specific criminal law power, which has been only gradually happening and in response to HIV, and I don't know of cases where other sexually transmitted diseases have been um, <coughs> in, implied or um, in, you know, under discussion in the cases, that has gradually happened. And it's actually not only sexual assault provisions, though, it, it, um, we've had convictions for murder um, in, in the case of criminalization of HIV and transmission of HIV in those circumstances. Um, and yes, Canada has been um, doing so, in my understanding, more so than in many other countries. Um, I did want to um, be sure that the audience wasn't left with the impression that this is only to do with vagin vaginal incourse, intercourse, the use of the criminal code provisions. It's not that at all. I, like I, I may have been out of the room mm -hmm. when it was discussed, but um, it may be that the cases so far have all been in the context of vaginal intercourse. I would have to look back at the range of them to see. But anyway, it's not that the criminal code provisions read that way and that perhaps they should be changed. It, they would certainly take um, circumstances of men having sex with men, for instance, as um, one of the areas that could be used, whether it is murder, manslaughter, or assault, or sexual assault, or assault causing bodily harm, any of those range. Yeah. So, before I thank Jackie, I am, oh, did you want to say one last thing? No, just thank you very much okay. for being here. <laughs> okay. um, before I thank Jackie, I, I have a few announcements myself. One is that our next seminar is on Friday, February 8th, and it is Amy Kapzinski from Yale Law School speaking on non-excludability and the limits of patents in furthering health. There are two um, events being hosted by the Novel Tech Ethics Group. First is at 7 p.m. Tuesday, January 29th, uh, these are both Café Scientifique, so they're open to the public and meant to appeal to the public. In fact, um, this one is being held at Dirty Nellie's, um, and it is on the human egg trade. Uh, there are three different speakers, one of whom is Jocelyn Downey. 
And on Monday, February 4th, 7 p.m. at Justice Cafe, another Cafe Scientific, on crisis of conscience, conscientious refusal by healthcare providers and access to care. Um, Barbara, do we have these out on the table out front? Or? Okay, so, or, and I have them here if you want to take them also. Well, so Jackie um, was very brave in coming before this um, partially legal audience and uh, speaking to us on whether whether HIV non-disclosure should be criminalized or whether it should remain a public health measure and whether it's counterproductive to have the criminal law operating in apparent conjunction with public health. And we're very grateful to you, Jackie, and please join me in thanking you.